Good afternoon. So I'm going to speak a little bit about the legal, uh, technical, and social challenges of FOSS and broadcast. So as described on the abstract, there's very little use of FOSS in broadcast. And in fact, it's really worse than the days of the Wintel dominance in the server room. And we first got to really explore why this is the case. Broadcast has large budgets and does prefer big engineering solutions. It has a culture of conservativeness. A lot of the broadcast engineers uh, are from the analog days. They really just aren't big fans of computers in general. Um, they do, some of them, they love hardware. And some of them really do like an ignorance is bliss approach of black boxes where they don't have a clue what's going on just as long as something comes out the other end. That said, there is quite heavy use of FOSS on the consumer side and in some professional devices, but it's never exposed to the end user. So why bother at all? What's the upside? Well, the broadcast chain is segmented. So FOSS applications can be slotted into place. You can take a piece of uh, proprietary hardware out and, t and replace it straight with FOSS. There's also some convergence now with the IT industry becoming more aware of IT standards. So in the past, you used industry-specific standards, such as DVB-ASI. Now you replace that with IP. And yes, IPTV is more aware of FOSS than, say, traditional broadcasting. But most importantly, and it does sound a bit cliche, but it's true, it's about the passionate and dedicated FOSS enthusiasts at broadcasters who make things happen, who can get FOSS deployed and work on these things in their own time. So yet, there are a number of social aspects involved. FOSS, FOSS has always been quite good at making tools, but in broadcast, it's all about big, shiny things. And unfortunately, owing to preconceptions in the marketplace, you do sort of, there is some sort of feeling that FOSS isn't up to scratch. And again, as I said, it's about finding the right people who can push, and that's usually in a small to medium-sized broadcaster, where there's not enough, there's, there's, a, there's resources that can be used, but not enough bureaucracy so things can actually get done. Another thing is, FOSS has to fit around current commercial and technical challenges, technical restrictions. People are not going to rebuild their broadcast chain or make major day-to-day -day changes to their, to their working day just to fit FOSS in. It's not going to happen. And for someone like me running a, a FOSS broadcast project, it does require a dictatorial attitude. You can't become a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. You cannot cater for everybody's niche case. You have to deal with a certain small set of cases that work well, and then perhaps expand from there. So there are a couple of... Two, well, here are two examples of, two, of some FOSS projects in broadcast. Casper CG, that's... Uh, oh, yeah, most of these are created by public broadcasters, since the remits of public service broadcasting generally align with that of FOSS. Casper CG is used by Swedish television 24 hours a day, and it's a production graphics system that allows, that allows them to use the same graphics on mobile, web, and TV. Dirac, created by the BBC, is used as a production codec and was used in the Beijing Olympics. However, it's fair to say that Dirac wasn't as successful as it could have been, technologically or commercially. One reason for this is at the beginning of Dirac, they said it could do everything. They said they were going to use it on i. They could use it on iPlayer. They said they could use it for television transmissions. They said they could use it here. But whereas, in fact, commercially, it's now probably really been outstripped by JPEG 2000. So what I and a number of broadcasters started to collaborate on is the open source, the open broadcast encoder. There have been a number of in-house uh, broadcast encoders before. Uh, for example, Free in France using VLC and Avail TVN in the US. Uh, all of these have been built on the strong base of the X264 encoder. That's used quite a lot now in Blu-ray, web. But, it's ne but X264 has ne never really had a proper, quote unquote, the head and the tail, the things that you really need to, to, to be used in broadcast. So we set out to build a top-end broadcast encoder that's usable on commodity hardware. To give you a, a, a point of reference, top-end broadcast encoders can, can cost about $50,000 each. What was quite interesting about the open broadcast encoder is it was developed entirely on production broadcast chains. In fact, you could say open source gave us more resources than our proprietary rivals. We were able to send, we were able to do development on live networks, send everything all the way to the home in some cases. One of the goals of the open broadcast encoder is to fit into current broadcast use cases. So that's, um, so that's distribution, encoding to the home. Contribution, for example, encoding from, to the, from a sports ground to a control room. 
that's usually very high bit rate and low latency. We're talking 200 to 300 milliseconds end to end uh, encoding for interviews. Technical stuff. Unfortunately, I didn't really have the time to go into all the broadcast engineering details. So here's a, here's a, here's a bit more from the text. A bit less broadcast engineering and a more fossy side of things. Uh, we're Linux only at the moment, uh, mainly because all our input devices only have Linux drivers. Though we do use a lot of the POSIX HR clocks. We may start using the kernel APIs for time packet release soon, so we can have near zero jitter on the output. But in fact, it's always been said that, that we would always have this problem in software with jitter, but it hasn't really been the case. We've always been comparable to commercial encoders in that sense. Um, X264 and FFmpeg lib AV, we've always used a lot of SIMMED. Uh, we use the x86 x86 part, but there's also ARM SIMMED. Uh, Google Code in students have written a lot of that. They're high schoolers, and they've written a lot of assembly in the last couple of years, and it's genuinely impressive to see, to see high school kids do that. Uh, in Linux, we'd also like to use transparent huge pages. We're a pretty, pretty good use case for it. We, pu we pump gigabytes of data through the bus every, every second, but it could never get them to work, help. And same transparent huge pages on file-based memory maps. That would be lovely, too. And there's always X264 optimizations and a good AAC encoder. But I appreciate that's in the realm of ponies at the moment. A common question I'm asked is, why not VLC? Why not GStreamer? Well, in broadcast, there are a ton of hacks, many, many hacks, just to implement features that in the rest of the world, 99% of people don't care about. And there are enough hacks in consumer formats already. There's also a psychological aspect, I think. VLC, in some sense, has been a victim of its own success. It's too successful in broadcasting. You can't somehow get people to realize that, well, I think it's very difficult anyway to get people to realize that the same application that you use to play back your mobile phone videos, whatever, can also be used to, for a major business case, for a, in fact, a critical business case. It, it just doesn't work psychologically. That said, Projects like OBE try to return as much code to FFmpeg lib AV or, or X264. We try and return as much code as possible. Uh, that can include SW scale optimizations, uh, LXF demux, that's um, a format used in professional broadcast playout systems. It is regrettable that this leads to work duplication. But we are genuine, I think all of us, all the developers are really proud that we, have, we are standing on the shoulders of giants here from FFmpeg, libav, VLC, etc., x264. Another thing I'm asked a lot about are patents, Theora, VP8, etc. Well, OBE is not almost always source code distributed, and we leave the patent royalties to the broadcaster to deal with. In practice, a lot of the broadcasters don't pay. It's as simple as that. Patents can also be a source of FUD in the future. Um, the news media likes to go on a lot about how MPEG LA are evil, blah, 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 blah. But in fact, they're very good. I could call them up today and be licensed by Monday. It's Dolby that's the problem. They're the only company that refuses to license to FOSS software. That breaks the terms of standardized, reasonable, non-discriminatory licensing. In my opinion, it's anti-competitive. I'm not a lawyer, but it's probably illegal too. Lots of people also ask about Theora and VP8. Well, the fact is, they're never going to be used in broadcast. <laughs> It's as simple as that. There was a window of opportunity maybe for Vorbis a couple of years ago that's also presenting itself now to Opus, but the development is very internet focused. There isn't that much awareness of broadcast, and that is a little bit harsh actually because it is quite complicated and it is quite politically difficult to get your codec standardized, but it can be done. For example, Opus doesn't, only supports two channels. That's supposed, it, well, although it can beat the next generation stuff from MPEG, if it only supports two channels, it will never be used in broadcast. There is a special announcement today, which is on Wednesday, it w the Norwegian TV station Frikanalen, community TV station, launched what we believe is the first FOSS digital terrestrial, that's DVB-T channel encoded with FOSS. So that was a little one small step moment for FOSS and broadcast. Um, this was done on a budget. There are still some teething problems. For example, there's a lot of inputs. The input signal has a lot of jitter. The, the server does need to be rebooted every morning, but it has. they were quite impressed in the control room from what I remember, from what I remember with the picture quality. So 
all in all, and there's, there's going to be further announcements soon, so there's, there's a long way to go, but we're getting there in small steps. Well, it seems I've got time for questions. Uh, come, speak me after, come speak to me afterwards. You can email me. That's it. Questions? Yep. So is there a possible podcast community other than through the OBE software? I think it's very, it's very loose. I mean, I know there are, there are loose communities between... So, for example, there are lo loose communities between for broadcast users of FFmpeg and X264, um, equally Casper and Dirac, but I don't think there is a proper Fossin broadcast sort of central place, and it is something that we are... We are thinking of organizing at some point. Because there, as, as I did say, there are passionate, there is probably in, in every broadcaster, there are passionate, and indiv passionate individuals who really want to get FOSS deployed. No, no questions? All right. Thanks a lot.